Hey, it's Rick Kettner here, and I thought it would be fun to quickly go through 10 of my favorite reads from 2021. There are books on business, on personal growth, and on other interesting topics that you might be curious to check out for yourself. So I figured I'd share some of my favorite books of all the books that I went through over the last year. These 10 really stood out to me, and I'm hoping that some of them at least will appeal to you as well. Now, before we dive straight into the list, let me invite you to share some of your favorite books from the past year by posting a comment down below. Let me know the titles of the books and perhaps share a quick description about what exactly you enjoyed most about each of the books. That way, for myself and for other members of the community, we could see some other potentially interesting books that we might consider checking out as well. But with that said, let's dive straight into the list, beginning with Good Strategy, Bad Strategy by Richard Rummelt. Now, if you've been watching this channel for almost any amount of time, you almost certainly know how much I enjoy reading about and thinking about business strategy, how to craft a plan for separating yourself from the competition, capitalizing on your strengths, and playing up against the weaknesses of rival brands. This book is a fantastic introduction to what business strategy is all about and what it's not about and creating a clear separation there. And it covers a lot of the fundamentals and provides many practical examples of businesses and how they've been successful at crafting a very strong competitive strategy. So if you're new to business strategy or you're interested in getting into it, this is a book that I highly recommend. One of my absolute favorite reads this year. Next on the list is The Serendipity Mindset by Christian Bush. Now, this is not the type of book that I typically seek on my own. I was just browsing the internet at some point this last year. I saw it in a reading list as being highly recommended for entrepreneurs, and the title seemed interesting. And I guess playing into the title a little bit, I thought, hey, why not just kind of give serendipity a chance here? Check out this book. Seemed to be well-rated, but again, not really on a topic that I would go out of my way to kind of dive into. But with that said, I'm very glad that I picked up a copy of this book because it provides a really interesting perspective on the notion of creating luck. How do we create more luck for ourselves in life? And in my experience, one thing I've always heard growing up is the harder your work, the more luck you create. And I always kind of created that association around the idea that if you work really hard, if you get out there, if you do more, then of course, better things are going to happen for you. But while that certainly can be true, everything that I just talked about can certainly be true, this book provides a slightly different and interesting perspective on how to actually increase your odds for luck, how to create the right conditions for luck to be more likely to happen. Now, of course, you can't predict how you will get lucky, and you can't choose the way in which you will get lucky. But following the advice in this book, you can create the right conditions and make it more likely that you'll make interesting connections or meet interesting people or have these kinds of things come together where suddenly you find an opportunity that if you weren't thinking in the same mindset, if you weren't creating the right conditions, you might completely miss. It might still be right there in front of you, but without kind of having the right mindset and the right approach, you might not actually capitalize or even recognize those opportunities as they come up. So if you're interested in learning more about this book, this is a book that I've done a detailed summary on that's gonna be published very soon. So if you're interested in checking that out prior to picking up a copy of the book, then I recommend that you subscribe and turn on notifications here on YouTube so you don't miss out when that summary is released. Next on the list is The Great Mental Models by Rhiannon Baubian and Shane Parrish. Now, there are three books in this series, and I think this is the very first time ever that a list like this, for me at least, has included three books from the same authors, especially here on the same topic. But in my opinion, these books absolutely deserve to take up three slots. So slots three, four, and five are taken up by this series because Mental models are one of those things that I've been interested in for a while now, but in 2021, this was kind of the year that I really dove deeply into mental models, not only by reading these three books, but some other books as well on the similar topic that also kind of presented interesting frameworks and ways to approach solving certain kinds of problems. Now, if you're not familiar with the idea behind mental models, the basic premise here is you develop a toolkit of ways to solve 
common issues. So when you face a similar problem again in the future, you kind of have a mental model for different ways to think about that problem and some potential solutions. They're not necessarily universal. Not every mental model is going to fit every different situation. But as you gain experience in solving certain kinds of problems, and as you get a sense for how certain models fit with certain situations, you can develop the ability to solve all kinds of problems in a much more effective manner. And I'll give you one quick example of a mental model, just so you can kind of see how this works. One mental model from this particular series is called inversion. And the idea here is often when you go to solve a problem, let's say, for example, you're trying to lose weight. What a lot of people do is they try to increase activity and energy and input. So if I'm trying to lose weight, I might try to exercise more or eat more healthy foods in my diet. We try to add instead of subtract. And what inversion calls us to do is look at the problem in reverse. Instead of trying to increase exercise or increase healthy foods, we might instead try to reduce sedentary behavior, reduce the amount of time we spend sitting in front of the TV or sitting at our desk, and perhaps eliminate the most unhealthy foods from our diet. And in some cases, this can actually be a much more effective approach than simply trying to add healthy foods or add exercise. And of course, you always have the option of doing both. But the basic premise behind this mental model is to think differently about this kind of problem. Now, another example, taking inversion and applying it elsewhere, let's say you're a city planner and there's a particular road or highway that doesn't have the capacity it needs for the amount of traffic that's trying to come through there. So every day, day in, day out, there's a traffic jam because the road just is not prepared for the amount of traffic that wants to travel down that road. Well, again, the typical solution would be to increase capacity, to add lanes, to add infrastructure, and to try to support the additional traffic that is trying to use the road. But Inversion would have us think about this problem differently. Instead of increasing capacity, we might look for opportunities to divert traffic to other streets, other roads, other highways that are under capacity. Or, for example, we might determine that there's a particular location like a Costco or a Walmart that is creating most of the demand for that road. And if we were to add another location or encourage the business to add another location, that might be another way to reduce the traffic demand on that particular highway. So again, same mental model, vastly different situations, but when we build up a toolbox of these kinds of ideas, and there are far, far more covered in this series, we can start to see how certain problems have recurring challenges. And as we gain experience, we can start to identify problems where we already understand a model or a framework for tackling that in a new and perhaps more effective way. Next up, we have Peak by Anders Ericsson and Robert Poole. This book dispels the very common myth surrounding natural talent and the common belief that world-class athletes and musicians and other talented creative people are just naturally gifted and they have an advantage that we could never compete with. This book explains the science behind expertise and how world-class performers become so incredibly talented at the end of the day, how they develop those skills, and it dives deep into not only why practice is so important, but how to practice more effectively, how to practice in the right way to accelerate the rate at which you develop a new skill or ability. I find this subject absolutely fascinating. I really enjoyed reading this book, and I'm almost certainly going to be publishing a summary and a more detailed look at some of the ideas from this book in the future. So again, if you're interested in learning more, then I highly recommend that you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss out when I eventually publish a summary on this book. Next on the list, we have Chatter by Ethan Cross. This is another one of those books that I just randomly stumbled upon. It's not typically something I would just go out of my way to discover, but I was browsing some recommendations from an author that I enjoy, and this book was mentioned. And when I looked at the cover and thought about it, 
it seemed pretty interesting and a topic that I might benefit from because one thing that I find, even when I'm filming these videos and doing these kinds of presentations, it's very easy to get stuck in your own head and to start thinking about the process rather than just simply focusing on the activity that you're engaging in. And this book talks a lot about that and the impacts for professionals, for athletes, for musicians, for all kinds of people for whom they're, they really depend on being able to perform in the moment. And there's this challenge that we often face where we have our inner voice and it can be distracting, it can be self-critical. There are all kinds of negative impacts that can take place when we don't know how to properly harness our inner voice and really manage that ongoing dialogue. So this book is an absolute must read for anybody that has a harsh inner critic or just wants to be able to focus and perform in certain situations and just deal with different things. Sometimes it might be an emotional challenge, might be a difficult decision, whatever it might be, this book offers some excellent advice for gaining mental distance and being able to think more clearly and again, manage your inner voice much more effectively. Next on the list, we have 4,000 Weeks by Oliver Berkman. Now, I might be somewhat biased having only recently completed this book and still having the ideas very much top of mind, but this for me is one of my favorite books of the last year. It's a very unusual take on productivity and time management. Now, if you've ever read a book on productivity or time management, you're probably familiar with a lot of the basic ideas of increasing efficiency, trying to get everything done, staying hyper-organized, trying to be very efficient, and at the end of the day, it's all about trying to use your time very wisely. But this book takes a very different tact. The main premise of this book is that there is a virtually unlimited sea of possible ways that you could spend your time out there. No matter how efficient you get, no matter how optimized your schedule becomes, there will always be more things that you could potentially do, more ways that you could potentially spend your time. And the author also makes the case, and this is one of my favorite insights from the book, that when you get more efficient at something, you actually invite more of it into your life. So for example, if you get more and more efficient at dealing with email, what tends to happen is you start to receive more email. You become known as the person that responds promptly and therefore other people, when they're thinking about who to email, end up choosing you when they're trying to solve a problem. So by becoming more efficient at email, we actually attract more of that kind of work into our life. And so it's kind of counterproductive to try to become more efficient at something like that. But at the end of the day, the core premise here is if certain things really matter to you, if there are things you've been wanting to do but kind of delaying until you have time or until you're organized or until you've cleared the decks and you're at inbox zero, if you've been waiting to do certain activities, one of the core messages in this book is to simply start. There will never be a perfect time. You'll never have your schedule clear. There will never be kind of that moment that it's finally right to dive into something. You only have 4,000 weeks in an average life. And so if something really matters to you, then just make it fit. Even if it means pushing other things out, even if it means you're not gonna complete everything else perfectly and on time, it's almost kind of embracing that fact and just recognizing you're always gonna have a little bit more to do than you have time to do it. And therefore, you might as well focus on the things that really matter to you, the things that are rewarding and purposeful. Now, that's not the best summary of the many ideas covered in this book, but hopefully that gives you a sense of what to expect from this book. And if you're looking for a fresh perspective on time management and productivity and really getting the things done that really matter to you, then I recommend you pick up a copy of this book. Next on the list is Tiny Habits by B.J. Fogg. Now, there are many, many great books out there on how to build better habits and how to break bad habits. Some of my favorite resources include Atomic Habits by James Clear and Mini Habits by Stephen Geis. Both of those are excellent, excellent resources. And of course, there are many other books on the subject. But 
What a lot of those books have in common is they reference the original research and work completed by B.J. Fogg, the author of this book. So if you're brand new to building better habits, or let's say you've read a book like Atomic Habits and you're just looking for a refresher and you wanna dive back into this theme, I highly recommend that you pick up a copy of this book. There will, of course, be a significant amount of overlap in terms of the fundamentals, but this book does cover some interesting perspectives and some fresh insights that I haven't seen covered in any other books on the subject. Next up, last but not least, is Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman by Richard P. Feynman. Now, I can't actually remember why I ended up picking up a copy of this book in the first place. It was probably recommended by a friend or a family member, but whatever the case may be, I'm very happy to have read this book. Immediately after completing it, I ended up going and buying a number of additional books by Richard Feynman and checking out some of his old lectures on YouTube. He's a very interesting character or was a very interesting character. If you're not familiar, he was very influential within theoretical physics. He led a very interesting life. I think at one point he was on the NASA team or the board that was set to investigate one of the major launches that went wrong. He had all kinds of interesting and diverse experiences in his life. And this book is not really anything to do with theoretical physics or anything specific like that. He just has a very fascinating way of telling various stories and relaying life lessons and talking about all the different experiences he had in his life. Just a very interesting perspective. And he had a very unique ability to take complex topics or themes and make them very approachable and really break them down and make them interesting. And just the way he explains things keeps you really engaged, and makes it much more interesting. So at very least, if you're interested in learning more about Richard Feynman, I do recommend you search his name on YouTube, check out some of his old lectures. If they seem interesting, if you kind of get a sense that his way of telling stories might appeal to you, then consider picking up a copy of a book like this. Just a really fun, casual read. You don't have to have any specific goal in mind. It's just one of those books that I highly recommend if you're looking for some light, entertaining, and inspiring reading, then definitely check it out. Anyway, those are 10 of my favorite reads from 2021. And again, I invite you to share some of your favorite reads from the past year by posting a comment down below. Include the titles of some of the books and a brief description about what you enjoyed most about each one. That way, for myself and for other members of the community, we have an opportunity to discover some other great books to consider reading over the next year. <laughs>